Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you very much, Roland, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm Martin Whitaker, uh, the CEO of Diurnal, and it's my pleasure to kick off uh, the presentations uh, this evening um, online. So Thionol is a specialty pharmaceutical company with one approved European product uh, and four other products uh, in progress. And importantly, um, it's a revenue generating uh, biotech company. We floated on AIM in 20, 2015 uh, and our current market cap uh, is around uh, 40 million uh, pounds. Our cash position at the end of 2019 uh, was 4.6 million pounds and that's been supplemented uh, recently by a successful funding round of £11.2 uh, million, pounds, which was closed in March of this year, uh, and also uh, some upfront uh, licensing uh, payments um, as well, which I'll come on to later in my presentation. We have no debt, and importantly, uh, we have long-term um, present uh, investors with expertise in the biotech sector. We also have an experienced uh, management team uh, that's got a proven track record of taking companies through to exit. So in terms of our investment summary, um, you know, we are an endocrinology specialty pharma company and we're very much focused on the endocrinology market. When I say endocrinology, that means hormones. And we believe that that's um, an opportunity approaching 10 billion uh, US dollars uh, per annum. We're very much about undress addressing unmet patient needs uh, in this area. Where our initial focus is around one sp specific hormone, uh, cortisol, and more specifically, it's diseases of cortisol deficiency. And we're targeting these diseases of cortisol deficiency uh, with two products. Our first product um, is Alkindi. It's a pediatric uh, product. Uh, it was approved uh, and launched in Europe uh, in 2018 uh, and is revenue generating. And in fact, um, in the last um, half, uh, for the first half of our financial year, uh, we generated over 1.1 million pounds in revenues from Alkindi in Europe alone. Alkindi is currently undergoing uh, FDA a review in the US, um, and we have also uh, licensed Alkindi to a company called Eaton Pharmaceuticals um, in the US, which we announced um, at the end of March of this year. We have a second product, a Chronocort, which primarily tackles adults uh, with these diseases of cortisol deficiency. And at the end of 2019, uh, we submitted Chronocort uh, for European market authorization, and we anticipate approval in the first half of 2021. In order to maximize um, our, our revenue and the value to the company and to our shareholders, the company has a direct sales force in key territories in Europe and we're forging commercial partnerships globally. These diseases of cortisol deficiency um, are orphan or rare diseases, and we have strong commercial exclusivity, which is break, uh, based firstly um, on orphan drug legislation, which offers 10 years market exclusivity in Europe post-approval and seven years uh, market exclusivity uh, post-approval in the US. And that's supplemented by a wholly owned diagonal patent portfolio which extends that exclusivity uh, all the way out to 2034. And beyond our two lead products of Alkindi and Chronocort, uh, we have a third product that's entering uh, clinical development, uh, Ditest. This is addressing uh, a very important unmet need um, in the endocrine space, that of low testosterone in men or hypergonadism. Uh, and that is just entering um, uh, clinical development alongside our earlier uh, pipeline, which is uh, maturing. So with those attributes, it is our vision to become a world-leading endocrinology specialty pharma company. I just want to go back to the opportunity and, and tell you how we're addressing these unmet uh, needs in endocrinology. So the endocrine system is critical to life, and the, en and the endocrine system is a collection of glands that produce hormones, the chemical messengers that regulate a number of important uh, bodily functions, including metabolism, uh, growth and sexual development. And the thing is with endocrine disorders, if your hormone um, is absent or your hormone production is disrupted through disease or through genetic causes, then this often leads to chronic 
lifelong conditions with ser serious health impacts for the patient. Of course, uh, the disease that everyone knows about is uh, diabetes, and the hormone uh, is insulin. And as you can see here on slide eight, this is a huge area on the left-hand side of the Venn diagram, uh, where large multinational companies have developed uh, several products uh, in this area and applied their trade in this area over the years. However, uh, Dianol spends a lot of time uh, speaking to clinicians, to patients, and to patients' groups. And the area that we're involved in endocrinology is on the right-hand side of the Venn diagram, where we've identified a multitude of diseases where patient needs um, are going unmet. And it's in this area that we're really able to um, we believe generate a good shareholder returns in an area where there is a, you know, a, a low competitive environment. Of course, we cannot tackle all of these diseases at once, um, and slide nine uh, shows our very focused uh, development pipeline. And for those of you that have followed Diurnal uh, since IPO, you'll have seen that um, the bars continue to move to the right um, in terms of our development. So now we are a commercial-based um, uh, biotech company. Uh, we've got products which are coming through to approval. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a, a, a pipeline um, which is entering uh, clinical uh, trials in these significant markets. So I just want to focus um, on our lead products uh, and the these diseases of cortisol deficiency and really explain to you why um, we are developing products in these areas. So cortisol is an essential hormone. It is essential for life. Without it, uh, you will die. And for those patients that cannot produce cortisol, uh, this, this causes fatigue, depression, and these patients are always at, re at risk of what's called an adrenal crisis, where we don't have enough cortisol on board to fight off an, an infection, uh, for example. And once you're lacking cortisol, then you need to be replaced with a cortisol replacement every day for the rest of your life. Two main causes of cortisol deficiency. The first is an acquired form of cortisol deficiency called adrenal insufficiency. Uh, the main causes of this are Addison's disease, which is an autoimmune disease, uh, typically presents um, patients uh, between 20 and 30 years of life. And this is where the body uh, destroys its own adrenal gland, situated just above the kidney, where cortisol is produced. And the second cause is hypopituitarism, and this is caused by a benign tumor in the pituitary gland uh, just behind the brain, um, typical onset, you know, 50 or 60 years of age, and this disrupts uh, the signaling from the brain to your adrenal gland. And the typical symptoms that adrenal insufficiency patients face are chronic, uh, chronic fatigue. And this is really debilitating fatigue simply where these patients do not have enough energy to get out of bed in the morning, and 50% of these patients, you know, uh, cannot work. The second cause of cortisol deficiency is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH for short, and this is a genetic disease. And this presents from birth, and it's caused by an enzyme block uh, in the body. And what happens um, to congenital adrenal hyperplasia patients is that they have two symptoms. The first one is they have this chronic fatigue that adrenal insufficiency patients have. And the second symptom is they suffer from high androgen levels or sex hormones uh, in the body. And these androgens or sex hormones are the building blocks of cortisol. And because of this enzyme block, they cannot be made into cortisol and build up in the body, causing harm. So, for example, if you're a little girl that's born with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, you may be born with ambiguous genitalia. So little girls are look, may look like little boys and may require corrective surgery at some time during their lives. Both little girls and little boys uh, go through puberty incredibly early early on during their lifetime, perhaps at the ages of five or six. So they grow very quickly as young children, but actually when it comes uh, to the teenage years, um, uh, with, where you know, the main growth spurt should occur, actually growth is turned off, so end up being much shorter than average um, than adults. And in adulthood, uh, complications continue uh, with metabolism, uh, with fertility, uh, and ultimately this patient group will die some seven years uh, earlier than the normal population. So these are really serious debilitating diseases that we're dealing with, and it's Diana's goal to treat these patients uh, with Alkindi, um, initiating from birth, transitioning to corona cord, to be able to treat these patients uh, for the whole of their lives. As I mentioned, the competitive landscape uh, for diurnal uh, is very favorable. We have very few competitors 
um, in, uh, operating um, in our area. Uh, in Europe, we only have one competitor, uh, Plenadren, um, which is currently only treats uh, one form of um, cortisol deficiency, the adrenal insufficiency, not the genetic disease. Uh, and in the US, there are a handful of competitors, uh, which are at the bottom of slide 11, but they are much earlier in their development um, than diurnal. So we have the lead um, over them in the US. So focusing specifically on our two products, Alkindi and Chronocore, beginning with Alkindi, which we believe is a major breakthrough in pediatric adrenal insufficiency. And although hydrocortisone, the active ingredient of Alkindi, was discovered some 60 years ago, actually no company has ever applied for a pediatric license, either in Europe um, or in the US. And up until recently, up until 2018, when Alkindi was approved, and this is what patients were taking, so crushed um, adult um, hydrocortisone tablets, uh, which were given to children from birth, uh, which was clearly not an optimal treatment um, in the 21st century. So Alkindi was authorized by the European Medicines Agency as the first licensed hydrocortisone product specifically designed to treat children with pediatric adrenal insufficiency, and hence, we've got first mover advantage. Uh, and over the past couple of years, we've been generating strong revenues uh, in Europe. The basis of the European approval is a pediatric use market authorization, um, or PUMA, and that affords us 10 years data and market exclusivity uh, from the date of market authorization. So we are uh, in that exclusivity period now. We've successfully launched a number of countries um, across Europe, um, which you can see on the screen. And we've also recently had pricing agreed uh, in the Netherlands. Importantly, it's, it's worth noting that we have achieved premium pricing over generic products in every single territory that we've applied for pricing for um, in Europe. Um, and we anticipate that will continue as we roll out um, our kindy into other European uh, territories. In terms of our European sales force that we've, um, that we've put together, um, we believe that this is a very valuable infrastructure for the company, uh, and it's the same commercial infrastructure that can be used uh, for Chronocourt um, in due course, um, should that be approved. As I mentioned earlier, in the US, uh, we have um, made progress with the, with the regulator. We anticipate approval of Alkindi uh, towards the end of September uh, this year, uh, with first revenues from early 2021 with our licensed partner at Eaton Pharmaceuticals. And I'll just go into um, the Eaton uh, deal in a bit more detail, um, as this is, um, occurred uh, just over a month ago, and really we believe um, it, it's game-changing um, for diurnal. So Eaton Pharmaceuticals is a US-listed specialty pharmaceutical company. It's listed on NASDAQ. It may not be a household name, but it is focused on hospital-based and pediatric-focused uh, products, which is where our kindy sit. And in launching um, its first product, um, coincidentally, Eaton was able to replace um, existing compounding products in the US, so they have a wealth of expertise in overcoming the regulatory um, hurdles of replacing compounded products in the US. In terms of um, how the deal is structured and how the collaboration is structured, uh, then Diana is responsible for the development and registration of Alkindi, uh, and Eaton is responsible for pricing, launch, and marketing and distribution of Alkindi. The highlights of the financial terms are a $5 million um, upfront um, non-refundable payment, which we have now received, um, cash and stock. Um, then there is a, some, a subsequent milestone of uh, payment on um, Alkindi achieving approval and orphan drug status. Uh, and thereafter, we have uh, sales-based uh, milestones um, and tiered uh, royalties on sales. So with Alkindi, uh, we're doing um, extremely well, both in Europe um, and in the US. Um, I'm now we move on to Chronocourt, our second product, uh, which treats adults with, uh, with these uh, diseases. So in terms of treating adults um, with um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, the uh, treatment um, options are slightly different here. Cortisol, as seen by the um, yellow line um, on the graph, has a very distinct uh, daily rhythm a daily rhythm which cannot be um, replaced by current treatment regimens. But what we've been able to do with Chronocort is that by creating a modified release hydrocortisone um, and giving Chronocort in what we call a toothbrush regimen, first in the morning, lasting at night, shown here in a blue line, is that we very accurately uh, can replace uh, the rhythm of cortisol. And importantly, we're able to control 
uh, these androgens or sex hormones which cause disease um, in the body. So when we tested Cronacort um, in um, CAH patients at the National Institutes of Health, um, we took um, patients who are on any treatment regimen, we switched them over to Cronacort, and after six months of Cronacort, 94% uh, of patients had their androgens or sex hormones um, into the optimal range, which was a highly significant result for us. And that phase two study carried out a few years ago was, um, was the basis for a subsequent phase three study, which was the largest ever interventional study carried out in this orphan uh, disease. And that is the basis for a market authorization submission um, in Europe. Uh, and coming up uh, next month um, at the ENDO online conference, um, the, date, the detailed data of that study um, will be presented. And that's the same data that's um, been shared with the regulators. Um, and we've also had a second study um, that we carried out in Cronacort, a safety extension study for patients completing the pivotal study. And what I can say about that study is that, again, uh, the benefits of Cronacort um, you know, are shown um, uh, in, in this ongoing study. So at our last um, data cut, we had a number of patients who have been on Cronacort uh, for more than 30 months. The retention rate in the study is very high. So over 91% of patients have remained um, on this study. Importantly, androgen control, this key disease indicator, continues on a lower dose of steroids than in the pivotal study uh, and in the literature compared to standard treatment regimens. We've seen unexpected therapeutic benefit um, with Cronacort uh, in terms of um, women becoming more fertile. We've, we've had patient uh, pregnancies and patient partner pregnancies, which were unexpected. Uh, we've had no adrenal crises with Cronacorts, which require hospitalization, um, and you know, adverse events are consistent with a known profile of hydrocortisone. So we're as confident as we can be in terms of uh, moving this product forward with the EMA through to registration in early 2021. In terms of maximizing the opportunity around the globe, um, I've spoken about Eaton um, in the US. Uh, we're investigating partnering uh, in Japan um, but where we've been able to move our product forward, uh, where countries uh, use the um, uh, European data package, we've already, we've already entered into marketing and distribution agreements with Emerge Health in Australia and New Zealand uh, and with Medison in Israel. And we anticipate approvals of Alkindi around the middle of this year and first revenues uh, towards the end of, end of this year. So to summarize um, all of these points, uh, really the next uh, three years, there's a number of uh, key value inflection points that are coming up uh, for diurnal. I think particularly uh, in Europe with the approval, or anticipated approval um, of Cronacort in early 2021 and a potential um, uh, line extension to this wider disease of cortisol deficiency, adrenal insufficiency uh, towards the end of next year um, as well. And based on our sort of current funding projections, um, and that should take us through to profitability um, as a company. In addition to that, uh, in the US, um, as I mentioned, we've got our kindy coming through to approval um, uh, imminently uh, in the next few months. Uh, and then beyond that, we've got plans uh, for further clinical studies for Cronacort in the US for both diseases of cortisol deficiency. So I'd just like to finish up on our third uh, product, which is a dye test, uh, which is this uh, treatment for uh, low testosterone or male hypogonadism, um, a huge, potentially huge market that's approaching five billion US dollars. Um, and here we successfully completed um, a phase one proof of concept study in our target patient population at the end of last year. So that's 24 men uh, with primary or secondary hypogonadism here in the UK. And what we were able to show for the first time was that for an oral testosterone, uh, testosterone taken as a capsule by mouth, was that we were able to show that we were able to replace testosterone levels to those seen uh, in healthy young men. Uh, we saw these testosterone levels were less variable than the um, uh, nearest um, oral uh, competitor uh, product. Importantly, um, we showed that testosterone diet tests could be taken either with or without food a major advantage over the, over, over the current competitor. We saw no serious adverse events with dye test um, and um, there's some good safety signals um, as, as well. So what we're doing now is we're taking dye test forward um, to discussions with the FDA, the US regulator, um, to really understand uh, the, the development pathway forward for dye test um, in the US 
and we expect that feedback around the middle of this year. So to summarise, um, it's been you know, a very exciting six months or so uh, for Diurnal. Certainly we've hit um, all the milestones that we set out um, to hit the last time we presented um, to shares, and you can see those on slide 21. Uh, and we have a number of uh, key uh, news for events coming up uh, for the remainder of 2020. So in terms of, of summarising, uh, we're building a global endocrinology specialty pharma company. We've already established a strong base and position in orphan diseases with Alkindi and Cronacourt. We have a credible market access strategy, which is generating revenues for the company. And we've got the opportunity to broaden our offering with our pipeline, including the testosterone program. And we have a strong team with the ability to deliver. So thank you very much. For, thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to taking forward um, and answering any questions. Lovely. Martin, thank you very much. Um, so say we, we've had quite a lot of questions. We don't have a huge amount of time, um, so I'm going to crack on. Um, we can still see your presentation, Martin, so you can go back if you need to um, to a previous slide. We had a question in very early, so I'm just to address that because uh, the, 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 the asker was uh, very timely. And, and asking about a recent fundraising, I think back at the start of March, um, were retail investors excluded? Um, can you also comment about dilution um, at that time? And kind of the final part too, that's one of three things in one. Um, yeah, a comment, the share price seems to be holding up pretty well. Um, do you think that current valuation, that current price is fair? So a comment on the fundraising and retail investors participation yeah. uh, and yeah. uh, dilution and the, the current price. Okay, so uh, so uh, thanks Roland. So, so in terms of uh, were um, retail investors excluded? Um, no, they weren't. I mean, the uh, the round was done at the market price, and that was a price of 32, 32p. Um, so on to the point on to dilution. So the dilution was, um, you know, minimal because the round was done at market price. Um, and in terms of our current um, valuation, well, I think, um, you know, share subscribers can make their own, um, you know, deductions about a company that's sort of re you know, revenue generating. Um, and you know it's got significant cash um, in the bank that could take it through to profitability um, versus the current uh, market cap. Thank you. Um, a question about pricing and pricing power. And you mentioned you managed to negotiate premium pricing. Um, would that premium pricing um, stay? How long is the, the pricing negotiated for? Is it a ten-year period? Is it renegotiated after every couple of years? Does it depend on the territory? I'm thinking mainly about Europe here. Yeah, so I think so. I think a very good question. Um, so with pricing, um, the issue with pricing in Europe is that although approval um, is centralised, so we've got a licence to market in all 28 or 27 European countries plus the UK, actually pricing and reimbursement is carried out um, at a local level. Um, and that, depending on which territory you're, you're negotiating in, it depends how long it takes to firstly get your price, um, and then within each territory, um, then subsequent to that, um, how your price is renegotiated. But typically, uh, prices are renegotiated um, every um, two or three years, um, and typically then they're sort of renegotiated based on a basket of other prices, um, mostly in the European uh, Union, uh, but sometimes with reference pricing taken from abroad as well. And are those, is that basket of those reference prices um, drugs in a similar area or are they a composite of, kind of drugs in a variety of different uh, conditions? No, so it'll be, so the basket will consist of the, the Alkindi price. So, so you're referencing your own price um, in, in the different territories. Okay, I see, I understand. Um, we're going to jump around a little bit here, um, so forgive me. Uh, once a child starts an Alkindi, are they obliged to continue on to the adult product? Or can they be switched out um, at a later, at an adult stage, to a potentially cheaper product? Um, so at the moment, um, the adult product is not approved. So if a child was reaching its 18th birthday, then it would currently be switched out to uh, another generic product. Uh, we hope that when Corona Court uh, is approved, um, that um, it would uh, be the first line therapy. Um, for switching from Alkindi to uh, to, uh, to Corona Court at the age of around 18 years. 
And but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be an obligation per se. There'd be a new. Uh, no, again, 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 it, it, it depends on on, on the country, um, but usually. Um, if there is a licensed uh, product for that disease, then um, the physician should be switching to that product. Okay. Um, question about Brexit. I haven't had the B word for a little while. Um, will a hard Brexit affect your projections? I, I guess that's your sales and revenue projections. Um, no, uh, we, we, we don't envisage that Brexit will uh, will, will affect our projections. Uh, we put out a note uh, last month um, about the COVID pandemic, um, but, but also the same would hold true for, for Brexit. We've covered this off. Uh, previously, we have um, set up a European subsidiary based in the Netherlands, uh, which holds all the licenses uh, for our EU products, um, and we've set up um, warehousing um, in, in the UK so that we can uh, bring product in from the EU to cover the, um, to, to cover the UK market. It's also worth note noting that our um, whole supply chain is within the EU, and that was one of the reasons for setting up uh, the company in that way. So. Um, so we're covered by a hard Brexit. A uh, question about the Eaton uh, Pharma deal. Um, and I was wondering, firstly, how, how that came about. Were, they, were those guys known to you um, or, or, or was going to have a, a fresh, uh, fresh inquiry or a fresh relationship? Um, yeah. And then, uh, and otherwise, um, I've had a question in, um, did any other kind of larger potential partners show an interest um, or, or were, uh, I guess, um, yeah, did you choose Eaton, or was it Eaton was the um, kind of the, 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 kind of the best game uh, or the best option? Yeah, no. So, so in short answer is uh, we, we did choose Eaton, um, and I think probably from the Venn diagram um, slide, um, you know, endocrinology outside of diabetes is actually quite a sort of small area. So, you know, there are you know a number of companies, but not a huge number of companies that are involved um, in that area outside of diabetes. I think we spoke to. Uh, most of the companies that are active uh, in that area, if not um, all of them. Uh, we spoke to companies uh, both large um, and small. However, we felt that going with Eaton, it was a company that really understood the Al Hindi product. Uh, they had experience um, in terms of this uh, compounding and switching out um, other unlicensed products uh, in the US. And although they may not be a household name, actually Al Hindi is a very big deal um, for Eaton. And you know, we are absolutely confident that you know, Alkindi will make a massive difference um, to Eaton and they're giving Alkindi their full attention. Whereas we felt with some of the larger uh, companies that had perhaps larger portfolios, um, Alkindi in particular uh, would make up a small component um, of their portfolio uh, and simply wouldn't get the attention that we believe it deserves. So that's why we chose Eaton. Okay, I've got time for one final question, Martin. So again, apologies if we've not got around to your question. There are quite a lot of questions about um, cash flow and, and, and revenue forecasts. So I think that should be where we should uh, conclude. Um, so could you give a, a, a guesstimate or a guidance on when you'd hope to be uh, uh, cash flow positive um, and you know, your current cash position, how, how long what you've got uh, we'll, we'll see you through to? Yeah, so I think in terms of being uh, cash flow positive, so it clearly depends on, on Corona Court being approved um, in, uh, in Europe in the first half of, of, of next year. Uh, we would then anticipate um, a launch of, of Corona Court, um, say around the middle of, of next year. And we've got two products um, generating revenue um, in, um, in Europe. So we would anticipate you know, being cash flow positive uh, 2022, uh, 2020, uh, 2023. Okay. Well, on that note, Martin, thank you very much indeed.